Hello, and welcome to another episode of The Soul of Business with Blaine Bartlett. I am your host, Blaine Bartlett. And, you know, the idea of the soul of business uh, is kind of an interesting concept, at least it is to me, and I'm assuming it is to you since you're listening. Um, But every organization starts off with this germ of an idea that kind of informs what it could be. And, you know, when we start thinking about uh, desire, uh, you know, founders have a desire to bring something to market, have a desire to bring something into viability. And desire is unrealized potential pushing against the, the crust of the soil to break into the sunlight. Uh, and to the degree that there's a lot of desire, uh, there's going to be a lot of power. How that gets channeled makes a difference. And so the channeling piece is one thing that I want to explore a little bit here. And our guest today, Mark McNally, is nobody. Uh, and I mean that very literally. Uh, he is the founder of an a accelerator uh, organization called Nobody Studios. And he is the chief nobody. That's how he puts his, uh, puts his moniker on his card. Um, he's been around for a long time. Um, one of his first startups, uh, he took public at the age of 24. And it yeah. yeah launched on NASDAQ and it reached a $4 billion market cap. And it was uh, actually the third most successful IPO in 1999. He's been around a while. He's launched a bunch of companies. He's had actually about 14 startups to his uh, credit uh, and you know, has overseen about $5 billion in exits. So this is a guy that knows something about taking desire and then bringing it to fruition in some very interesting ways. And in that journey, he's learned some things. And for you, those of you that are listening today, what he's learned, I think, is going to be absolutely uh, salient, you know, to, <laughs> for lack of a better word here. It's going to be important for you to actually pay attention to this. So, Mark, I want to just welcome you to the show. Blaine, thank you so much. Glad to be here. Yeah, it's good to have you here, for sure. Um, give me some idea, uh, just uh, as, a, as a starting point here. When you hear the soul of business, what does that bring up for you? You know, it resonates strongly. Um, you, you know, I got started in my career. There'd be sayings like, if you want a friend, get a dog, you know, but business is business. And I think that, you know, my journey, I'm definitely on the opposite end of that extreme now, where I just really believe that the interconnectivity of our lives and the amount of time we put into our work, um, I think we and how we interact with each other, what you feel from your work, the reasons, your why. I mean, people talk about why now a lot more in the last few years than they ever did before. Um, but when you talked about kind of the desire, it kind of brings that up for me too. It's like when the why is strong enough, the how will be figured out. Right. And Mm -hmm. so I just think that that's, um, you know, it's a core to success. It's core to what we're doing at nobody studios. We put a lot of energy and time into, um, just thinking about, um, you know, thinking about how we align our people, um, how we recruit the right people, how we qualify the right people, you know, one of the reasons why we're, we're called nobody is because we always knew that this was going to be bigger than any one person. You know, this is going to be really essentially a movement. Uh, we're attracting people that are wanting to do something bigger and better. Um, they want to do something for, for bigger reasons. Um, and I really think that's, that's one of the reasons why we've been able to attract really special talent to the journey. Um, people that have multiple places they could work and want to work, but uh, yeah. they've come here because they think they can really be a part of something to make the world a better place. You know, as an incubator, um, I mean, you are, I, I think nobody's studios is, is really unique. And, uh, and full disclosure, I've been, you know, talking with Mark for some time. I do some advisory work, you know, with the, with the, uh, the organization as well. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm just thrilled with what you're up to because it comes at the idea of generating viability from a fundamentally different position. I think than many you know, uh, incubators start, particularly VC uh, funded organizations uh, will approach it. So, what what's the difference that you? What's the difference that makes Nobody Studios unique? Well, there's a lot of things we talk about our kind of DNA points, but uh, you know, first of all, we refer to ourselves as a venture studio. It's kind of the, the <laughs> asset class that most people understand. Um, in that we, we really are founders. So, you know, venture capital for most part is like a passive investor, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's really not 
all that different from you investing in a mutual fund. I mean, unless you're the biggest check, you might have some board seat, but you don't really have control over those companies. And so venture capital is at risk for a lot of, you know, twists and turns along the way when you kind of make an early stage investment. Um, accelerators, you know, I really love the idea of accelerators when they came out. Um, and I served as a mentor on a number of them. But what I found was that, you know, accelerators really have such little skin in the game that it really just becomes kind of a, a mentor network. But unfortunately, when you're a mentor to somebody, they're only, you're only giving them, a, you know, one hour a quarter. You're just, you're forced to look at that business through a straw. You're making up some really quick, you know, guidance and, you know, some, some you know, cliche kind of advice, but you're not really deep, deep, deep into those businesses, right? And I think that, you know, a lot of, entrepreneurs look at accelerators and they look at the, the networks and the resumes of people who are connected. They're like, Oh my God, those guys are going to help me build my business. The reality is we don't, <laughs> there's just not enough skin in the game to give it the time. Right. So at a venture studio, we're actually founders and creators. Like we own the, a lot of times we own the majority of the company. We're funding it from day one. We're taking it from the whiteboard into the market. Um, and our goal as a studio is to be really hyper good at that first kind of zero to 18 months and building super high quality early stage companies and then we're, you know, have fantastic relationships across the investor community that want to support us as those companies come out of the nest and that they've been truly validated. Um, but we put our skin in the game to get them off the ground and, and prove that we've, you know, built something, which also means we have to kill ones that aren't working or we have to mm -hmm. merge them or pivot them. You know, we really have a, not just the, um, the ability to change companies, twist companies, pivot them, whatever. We have an obligation because we want to be we want to be known for building really high quality companies. When we go out and tell investors this one's ready for external funding, we want that to mean something. We want our brand to mean something. So yeah, yeah. I mean, so well, I was, you said what makes us different. So that's just the structure. Um, we are building companies ourselves. We're doing them fairly aggressively. We've got a goal to do 100 companies in five years. Um, <laughs> we really, and we picked that for a reason, right? We, we, if I said I was going to do 12 companies in five years, you might say, oh, wow, that's a lot. But yeah, I can see, I guess how you could pull that off. You're going to throw more people at it, work a little bit harder, throw more money at it. Right. But when you say I'm going to do hundred companies in five years, you stop and go, okay, wait, you have to do something totally different. Right. And we, we talk about that a lot internally that we're reinventing a new way to build companies faster. Um, in a lot of ways, we're doing things leaner and meaner, which is a very contrarian to where the market is right now. Um, mm -hmm. There's just been a, a, a massive amount of venture capital in the last few years, both in how the funds that have been raised, but also the, how they're deploying capital into startups. And we're actually just not fans of that. <laughs> we believe that there is something really special about maxing out your credit card and borrowing money from grandma to get a company off the ground. You tend to focus on building companies that are viable that people pay for. Um, mm -hmm. And when you get so much money in early stage, and it's just really, unfortunately, it's a, it's a, um, the cause of it is this essentially the amount of capital that went from Wall Street into venture capital in the last four or five years, which before there was a hard line. Venture capital did their job. They handed it off to Wall Street. Wall Street, you know, enjoyed the public markets. But when some of our big unicorns didn't go public whenever they expected them to, and you see people go public at like $60 billion valuations, Wall Street was like, wait, we're not seeing the same pop that we used to. We used to get these guys at $500 million and enjoy the $30 billion pop. And so they just packed up their money and went to Sand Hill Road, which is where most VCs are in Silicon Valley. And they started saying, we want to invest in the VCs. So the VCs went from when I started my career, a VC fund of a $50 to $100 million fund was a pretty sizable fund. Yeah. Um, and just even a couple of years ago, if someone told me they raised a $300 million fund, I'd be like, wow, you guys are killing it. Now you're seeing people regularly raise one and a half billion dollar funds. For, and that's just one fund within the venture capital firm. Um, what that does isn't that you're able to invest in more companies because you still have a bandwidth mm -hmm. issue. What it means is you have to write bigger checks. Yep. And there was a, you know, there's a theory that certainly some people, I mean, Andreasen pioneered this on SoftBank, which is the idea that if I put enough capital into something, it'll, it'll absolutely be successful. And I yeah. think there are certain businesses where that's true. You know, if you're doing a, a super long-term R&D play or it's a device or it's hardware, there's certain things where that is absolutely true. But in this day and age and in, in kind of digital products, you don't have to spend all that money. In fact, if you are, if you have that much money, what happens is again, going back to why I think it's, it's really hard on early stage companies, is you end up focusing on a lot of the wrong things. Mm -hmm. So you end up saying, okay, what's my headquarters going to look like? What color paint is it going to be? 
uh, who are the 18 executives I need to hire? Where, where's my office in, you know, Warsaw going to be like, you start think because you have so much cash in the bank. Whereas at the earliest stage, I think you need to be like, I built a product. I stuck in the market. Did people click on the buttons? I thought they were going to click. Did people click buy? Did they put their credit card in? Did I hit revenue? And those kinds of experiments, I'm not saying you can't do them when you raise too much money. I just think it becomes very distracting. And I think that you can cover up a lot of mistakes. Um, When you've raised that kind of capital, um, you have a whole board now that's like, I bet on you. I gave you $20 million. You said this was your thesis. Well, what about three months from now when you realize you're wrong? It's kind of hard to go in that boardroom and say, hey, we're pivoting. And so it's, again, way too much early on, I think, is it gets in the way of the experimentation and kind of the, the real agile, you know, learn, test, experiment, grow process that we, we just really embrace. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, all of that. I mean, I love that. I, I, this is one of the reasons that I was so excited uh, to, to get connected with you and, uh, and the studios is that entrepreneurial, I'm going to call it the entrepreneurial uh, uh, zeitgeist. Yeah, if you will. I mean, it's just kind of what makes an entrepreneur an entrepreneur. It's you know not it's not an easy road. It's yeah, you know, you know, steel sharpens steel, sort of a thing. And you know, pressure creates diamonds. And I mean, all kind you know, all kinds of metaphors come into play here. Yep. But, um, <laughs> but the idea of yeah taking from zero to eighteen months, and you know, and then having something viable in that period of time. Um, how do you keep the founders you know, focused? Now, you know, the money side of it is one thing, obviously. I mean, you know, don't give them so much that they you know, lose, lose focus. But how do you keep the, and, and this is specific to a culture question, because you're, you know, when you're building an organization and there's kind of this focal um, uh, bifurcation that goes on where, yeah, I've got this thing that I want to do, but I also know I need to build a culture and a company is a consequence of that that can support this happening. So the founders oftentimes aren't in a position to do both at the same time. Yeah. I found very few founders that actually can do both of them well. Yeah. So how, how does that get addressed? Um, well, you know, I think um, we got introduced by Sajel Thacker. Um, yes. Sajel's our chief cultural officer, and, and I was a fan of her content for a, a number of years. Um, and I reached out to her when I didn't have any full-time employees and it was me and my dog in my garage working on nobody studios, you know, two years ago. And, um, I reached out to her and I said, I'm looking for a chief cultural officer. And she's like, it sounds fascinating, but you're crazy. You have no employees. You know, I can hear your dog barking in the background. Um, and I said, no, but this is, you know, this is definitely different. Um, one, I've always appreciated culture more and more throughout my career, but it meant a lot to me in the very beginning. So it's something I've always honored and put a high value on, but, I also realized that my, some of my biggest failures, you know, companies that could have been really well that didn't succeed was when we got people wrong or a certain type of person or a certain type of culture came in. So, I mean, it's really dear, near and dear to my heart, but I also, I told her, I said, the reason why you need to be on here early is because we're going to grow very fast and we're going to have global nobodies in a number of years. And the only way we can keep all that stitched together and really pull in the same direction is by getting culture right from the very beginning. So yeah, we're going to be talking about this, six months before our first employee um, because it's something that has to be indoctrinated into everything we do and how we think and how we, you know, make decisions. And, you know, I think it's a, uh, there's a lot and we're, we're very people focused in our kind of all of our DNA points as people first. Um, and it means a lot of things to us. It means we're, we're one trying to create an environment where people can be human. Um, you know, I think that, you know, previous playbooks would be, um, you know, you wanted people to be very focused and you want them to be there eight to five and, you don't want to hear about any of their distractions. And, you know, if someone says, oh, I've got another idea for a company, then they'd be labeled as, you know, you know, too much of an idea person doesn't know how to get things done. I mean, there's just so many labels that quickly get attached to people. And we don't think that that's really who we are. I think that we, we think about lots of things. We're very creative folks, of, you know, individuals as humans. We, we like to do multiple things at once. If you're in a garage band and you're playing covers on the weekend, I want to know about it. Uh, maybe I want to stop by and cheer you on. And, you know, the old playbook would be keep that to yourself because your, your job's going to think you're not focused, you know. Um, mm-hmm. If you have multiple ideas, you know, you usually keep that to yourself or do it as a side hustle. We're like, no, ideas are our lifeblood. Let's go. What else do you have? Um, 
you know, one of the things we did early on, and I'm not sure anybody's done it yet or anybody ever will again, but um, we decided to make sure that if you're part of any one of our companies, you're in equity across the entire portfolio of Nobody Studios. Yeah. That's, so, uh, yeah. yeah. So at the scale of what we're doing, you know, we're doing it across industries and globally, and we're going to be doing a high volume of companies. That's a really exciting thing that's never been offered to a startup employee. You know, as investors, we understand the portfolio approach. You're going to say, oh, I'm going to invest in 10 companies. Six aren't going to work. Three might do okay. And one's going to be a home run. And that makes my percentages work out, right? But if you're a startup employee and you work for one of those six, that kind of sucks. And if you work for one of those six, two or three times in your career, you've got a bad career, right? Um, So we're just trying to change that. We're just trying to bring an environment where we've got, you know, the right vibe, the right energy, problem solving, kind of an atmosphere of having each other's back. You know, where taking risks is actually encouraged, not just tolerated. Um, that's what we're trying to create here. And I think it's attracting a special breed. Yeah, I think it is. I mean, it strikes me, uh, you know, Marcus Aurelius uh, in, in uh, Meditations, his uh, private diary that became very public, uh, you know, the Roman emperor, uh, he had a yeah. quote, uh, you, know, par- you know, just paraphrase it roughly here, I think. Think often of the bond that unites all things in the universe and their dependence on one another. And the, the whole idea of everything is connected in some way, shape, or form. 100%. That, yeah, uh, it's, yeah it, it's the basis for my thesis on compassionate capitalism. Uh, because, you know, it's impossible for me to care uh, about something that I don't feel connected to. Yeah. So part of what you're doing with the studios is ensuring that people feel connected. And people, you know, they, they care. <laughs> yeah, it's like you said, uh, everything is interconnected. Not everybody is there, but, but we are and we operate at that level. Um, you know, it's, it's right along the lines of the law of attraction, you know, and we've, you know, we started telling our story. I really just embraced this idea that I just, uh, my story had never been more solid, more true. It comes from my, you know, my toes and my fingertips and my, you know, my entire career. Um, and so I'm just like, I'm just going to tell my story. What are we doing and why? And I'm going to let the universe bring me the people I need. And it seems like that just continues to happen. I've been, you know, super humbled and and, and grateful by the folks who said, you know, I want to be a part of this. Um, and it just seems to happen serendipitously every day. If we're we're talking internally about, gosh, we really need to find someone that can do X, Y, and Z. And you know, a couple hours later, someone's going to make an intro. You know, someone I haven't heard from in two years will say, "Hey, I've been watching your post on LinkedIn. You should meet this person." And it's exactly what I just described. So, those kinds of moments, I don't believe are coincidental. I really actually yeah. believe that's vibrating at the right level. Um, you know, interesting thing about the law of attraction, especially something you know this grand, at least of what we're trying to do, is it also requires you to you know constantly vibrate at that level. You know, it's not something yeah. you just do because it's in your diary. <laughs> Yeah, it's not something because you have a pep talk and everybody goes, okay, let's vibrate. No, it's like, it's got to be coming genuinely from who you are and how you operate. Yeah. And and we're all, you know, human. So if I ever see something or if I'm not liking a certain interaction or a progress or whatever, I'll go inward and I'll stop and say, okay, what am I vibrating? What am I putting out? What, you know, and, and almost always, you know, that's created for me a, a much more spiritual connection and, and, you know, my ability to really reset where I'm coming from because we're all human, right? Things do affect you throughout the day or the week or the month. Um, It could be just a lack of sleep one week for something, right? A sick kid or whatever, but those things all affect your your rhythm. And if I feel things are just off, I will take a pause or, you know, I'll take, you know, the afternoon off or I'll give myself a nap in the afternoon. I'll go inward and I'll meditate. But I just think that that's, it's a vibration. If we always are given that off, then there's, there should be no stopping us. Now, I want to pick that up because, you know, oftentimes, you know, when people in the business world hear conversations about vibration, frequency, law of attraction, uh, you kind of go, okay, there you, what part of California are you from? Number one, number two. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, th- this is all magical thinking and stuff. It's not magical thinking. And I want to come back to that. We're going to take a real quick break because I want to actually talk about that in the context of what you just spoke about in terms of yeah, specifically not paying attention so much to the how, just trusting that if I'm in the right place, vibrationally, things can't not appear. And we'll kind of unbundle that here in just a minute. Okay. Well, I thank you for listening. Um, I want to also invite you right now to go to blainebartlett.com. 
And on that site, which is my personal website, you'll see uh, services up on the top menu. I'd like you to click on Leadership Mastermind. Now, why I want you to do that is we have uh, structured a mastermind program that is very unusual and it is very powerful. And by going onto that site and clicking that link, you'll be taken to a landing page that is an invitation to join this mastermind. It's a 52 week long exploration of what it takes to be a highly effective leader in today's fast changing environment. You won't regret it. And if you've been liking what you've been listening to on these Soul of Business podcasts, how does one become a leader that can keep connection to the soul of business? That's what we look at. That's what we're about in this mastermind program. So again, go to blainebartlett.com and click on the services link. And there you'll find the link to the Leadership Mastermind program. Look forward to seeing you there. Thanks for listening to this little commercial. And now back to our show. Three, two, one. Welcome back, folks. And talking with Mark McNally, uh, the chief nobody at Nobody Studios. Uh, just before we took our break, Mark, you had mentioned, uh, and actually I was very interested in the way that you actually positioned this about just kind of tapping into a frequency, a vibrational state that in, in the net of it is, you know, at whatever level I find myself, you know, living, you know, just you know, use the word living as a metaphor or an analog to frequency, you know, I, I occupy a certain frequency state in my life. And anything that is on that frequency appears to be visible for me. I have access to it, that sort of thing. So I started off um, this episode with saying, you know, desire is actually that unfulfilled potential seeking to be uh, expressed. There's a certain frequency to that unfulfilled desire, that unfulfilled potential, that unfulfilled function that, you know, once it starts to express itself, it starts literally quote unquote vibrating in a certain way. And as a consequence of that vibration, anything you know, that's on that frequency plane appears as resource. So that's the metaphysical explanation for you know, how, how you can grow a company. Uh, in practical terms, quote unquote practical, for those of you that are listening that have a practical mind and are interested in this, what this moves us away from is a concern about the how because the how always takes care of itself. Yeah, it's, it's always going to be consistent with what frequency I'm on. How have you found that to work? You were just referencing it you know, a little bit before uh, we took our break. But in, in terms of the, the way that you're incubating these firms, uh, accelerating them, you know, 200 or 100 companies in five years, you got to have certain frequency structures in place here to actually you know, scale in that way, in a healthy way, because you talked about being healthy uh, yeah. as you're doing this. So g and give me eight bars on that. Let's just riff a little. Yeah. Um, gosh, I mean, I think that for people who are not exposed to this, I, I'll point them to like Avatar, you know, James Cameron's movie, you know, yeah. and I'm like, you know, the whole world's connected, you know, and I think what's wild about that movie, that was what, 15 years ago, I think, or, but, um, you know, there's a, we're really, you know, one of the areas we're fascinated with in health and wellness is uh, plant medicine and psychedelics and some of the things that are breakthroughs in that space. And there's a great, great show on Netflix called Fantastic Fungi. Yeah, um, beautiful show. I love that. It show. is, but it's absolutely wild because it's Avatar, right? I mean, yeah, they actually show how the fungus is really the operating system of of our entire world, and that you know trees that are dying can use fungus connected to the roots to give other trees food and nutrients, and they actually communicate intelligence across you know, uh, you know the plant plant life you know throughout the entire yeah. forest. Mycorrhizal, and, yeah, the yeah, it's just absolutely yeah. fascinating, right? So. Um, you know, look, I think, you know, for me, one of the things that vibration meant, um, you know, throughout my career, you know, I've had a, a career that, you know, I'm proud of. And, uh, you know, I, I realized that a lot of people would, would like to have had my career. So I don't have any regrets. But there were times, many times where, you know, there's always like, okay, you're, you're somehow making a sacrifice for the job or the salary or, you know, maybe you're dealing with someone you don't like, but there's persons, you know, above you or, you know, I don't know. There's always, I felt like I, the last 10 years specifically, I realized that I had made a lot of choices as a 
new father and a new husband, you know, 15 years ago, making things safer, you know, trying to be more conservative. Um, but what happens is that ends up becoming conflict within yourself. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, one of the reasons why nobody is, is, you know, I think growing what we're, you know, got big, bold visions is because I had a, a breakthrough three years ago when I decided to do this. Um, and I'd come off a, a first kind of health event in my life. So it was a time where I was like really focused on, on healing. Um, and then when I was, I'm like, okay, what am I going to do for the rest of my life? You know, what am I supposed to do? What is my purpose here? What's my legacy? How am I going to impact the world in the best place? How am I make my boys proud? And, you know, I did conclude that startups is something I knew, but that wasn't going to be the foregone conclusion. I had to realize that I had a passion for startups as the only vehicle I know in life that you can actually point to something that's irrational and you have a shot at pulling together the people and the resources and you might actually pull it off. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's, that's the edge of where we're going to make this world a better place. I think it's where we're going to change things worldwide. And so I realized that that vehicle was how I was going to leave my mark on the world. Um, and, you know, I was on a, I was on another podcast uh, not too long ago and they asked me at the end, you know, Mark, you know, tax, toxicating vision, but how are you going to know when you arrived? How are you know when you're there? Um, because he said, I feel like you're going to be doing this for, you know, 30 more years. And I said, well, I hope this is the last thing I ever do. But uh -huh. I said, that, here is my answer. I said, there'll be a day someday in the future where an entrepreneur I have not met in person from a country that I have not been to physically is going to identify a problem that I don't resonate with and proposes a solution in the form of a viable company that I don't, I might even be dubious about. And they successfully bring that to life and impact the world for the better. That'll be the day we yeah. arrived. And I truly believe that's only a few years out. Um, and that'll be what I knew that we created something here that can connect to like-minded folks and, and have a positive change in the world. And, you know, I think that the, vibration as soon as I was able to kind of drop all friction within who I wanted to be make a big bold statement that I'm going to do this and I think one thing's you know successful entrepreneurs tend to have in common is I don't even know if they it's naivety uh, you always need a certain amount of naivety um, but they absolutely <laughs> yeah. truly 100% believe that they're going to make what they're doing happen and if they don't mm -hmm. you know that's one thing when I was doing a little bit of angel investing along the way that was always the thing I was looking for. Does this person really believe in it? Is their why strong yeah. enough? Or they think it's a good business? And you'd be surprised. You know, about 80, 85% of the people I come across in the entrepreneurial world, they have something in the entrepreneur thing, but they don't have that. Now, yeah. maybe 10 years from now that they nail it because they find something aligned with their why and they go nail it. And maybe right uh -huh. now, these other startups they do are just training ground. I think that will probably happen for me a little bit in a couple of stops. But this is the way I'm going to change the world. This is the way I'm going to have the biggest impact on folks. And it's hundred percent aligned with who I am, my values, my lessons. Um, and so again, I think that that vibration can't be wrong. And, you know, the other side effect when you're growing something so fast, like we are, you meet a lot of new people. I mean, you and I yes. met along the way, but because I can feel, you know, a, a resonance of vibration, we can build a relationship and even a friendship very quickly. And, you could know other people 10 years and not have that. Right. Exactly. So I think as we've broadcast that energy into the universe, we've been able to bring some really special people to the journey. And I would say I've met some of my closest, you know, friends I've met in the last couple of years. And I didn't used to say that, you know, I've just been really enriched by some powerful personalities and amazing people that have joined us along the way. And I know we're just getting started. So that's pretty exciting. That's a, where can people find out more about nobody studios? Nobodystudios.com. It's uh, the site says it all. Um, yep. And, uh, you know, I'm always an open book so people can, you know, connect with me on LinkedIn or drop me an email, mark at nobodystudios.com. Um, we're always looking, you know, I say the things that make our world go round are talent, you know, it'll be our rocket fuel, it'll be people, um, influence. So if people have the ability to help turn up the volume on what we're doing, we're grateful. And then capital, you know, we know this is a big swing. So we're always also bringing in, you know, investors and partners into the studio and, and, all those things make us, uh, you know, better and more successful. So it's uh, we're on a, we're on a fun ride. Yeah, you, you certainly are. I mean, it's, it's a fascinating journey. Are there, I mean, and this is a question that just popped into my head and feel free not to answer. Uh, uh, but just, yeah, are there any particular companies that you're shepherding right now that you are really excited about? 
yeah it's funny i do get that often um and it's like asking which is your favorite kid i think <laughs> yeah i know <laughs> um and especially because you know we started the studio with uh, an idea board that i've been building over the years and so the 14 that are currently in development were all conceived of by me so it's even harder for me to <laughs> be subjective because <laughs> they're all brilliant um no you know i I tried to answer that. And then as I get into each company, I just light up on each one because they all have a chance yeah. to have a big impact. I mean, we have a concentration in health and wellness. Um, we you know, really believe that, you know, we're doing some special stuff that's going to change substance abuse treatment and mental health. Um, like I mentioned, the psychedelics, we're, we're in, very excited about um, longevity. Uh, we're kicking off a pretty interesting project in sleep and dreams. Um, but all these uh, things are about, improving the you know, human condition and yeah. you know i i hate to criticize the healthcare system to have such respect for so many people who work within it mm -hmm. and but here's how i answer it i think the health system today in the united states was built for trauma so it, it is. is a place if you get a car accident or a gunshot you want to be in the united states but we'd have no real clue on how to do wellness um and I really believe that the shift in the companies that we're excited about is really about empowering the patient. Um, I spent 10 years trying to sell complex AI and software to the healthcare industry, insurance companies, the government. Uh, and I learned the hard way that that's the brick wall you don't want to run into. And so I really think the shift now, especially because of biometrics and, and the amount of data people have available to them, mm -hmm. it really now is about empowering the patient. And it's actually out of necessity because we have a referral based system and there's actually no doctor who has a single point of view of what's going on in your health system or your life. That's right. It's yeah. only the patient. So I think that there's going to be a whole new wave of products about empowering the patients. And, and we're excited about that. But, you know, outside of that, we've got, you know, concentrations within FinTech and uh, travel tech, agri tech, clean tech. I mean, all those things. I mean, how can you not get excited about, you know, clean tech or making yeah. you know, crops more efficient or, you know, empowering humanity by the democratization of finances um, these are all things that let light us up. Um, and, you know, we're, we're launching one that be in the market, uh, this quarter called ovations with a Z and the mm -hmm. CEO of that is, uh, Ray Leonard jr. Uh, sugar yep. Ray Leonard's yep. son. Yeah. I talked uh, with him the other day. Yeah, yeah. Super, super human individual, uh, become a really good friend in the process. But, um, you know, we had that on the board before we named it ovations. And, uh, when I got to know Ray and he stalled, he saw it on the idea board. He kept asking me about it. Um, and I said, why are you so excited about that product? So what the product is, is it basically enables uh, online booking of speakers, experts, and talent, but in a yep. Zoom world, right? We all live in a Zoom world right now. So don't go through the speakers bureau and book somebody for your Las Vegas event. Maybe I just want to book Blaine Bartlett for 15 minutes of wisdom on my staff meeting, right? And I'm on the, I'm on the Ovation site, so... Perfect. So, you know, <laughs> that was one where Ray explained to me how much, you know, he's like, you know, his father basically is made most of his income since retiring was all on speaking. Yeah, and he's speaking, like, so then yeah. I, yeah. And he's like, then I got into it and I've been doing it for 10 years. And you know, he'll tell you 2020 killed him because all of his physical events got canceled. So there's a strong why there and there's a strong passion there and experience. Um, anyway, we're launching that to the market. We expect that one to be a, a rocket ship, but we're also excited again about empowering people because we really believe that marketplace is going to sizzle in emerging speakers. Right. Yeah. Somebody who's written a book, but maybe they, they've never done a paid speech or they've done one a year. Right. Um, Sajal Thacker, she's, you know, two time TEDx she's speech. Um, we've got, you know, I saw her this weekend do her TED talk and it was awesome. Yeah, it was um, awesome. I saw it. Yeah. And uh, Barry O'Reilly's my chief incubation officer. He's a two time international best selling author. Um, but, you know, he might do two paid speeches a year. You know, if people had access to Barry O'Reilly for. 500 bucks for 10 minutes, 15 minutes to talk through a product problem or innovation problem. I mean, how much could he help unlock or unjam people yeah. with just these small little tidbits, right? Yeah. So I love the idea of empowering people to have their voice brought out there more, but also you're empowering bookers. So we have an emerging category of bookers where before, if you weren't Oracle, you weren't thinking about booking, you know, Barry O'Reilly to speak at your, you know, your keynote. Um, but now you might be a triple A plumbing in Dallas, Texas. And you're like, you got your sales meeting coming up and I'd love Ray to come in for 10 minutes and do a pep talk. That's, that's yeah. cool. It was never possible before. So we're just excited about empowering people to do stuff they couldn't do before. I love it. I love it. Connection. Yeah. Democratization, digitization and yep. uh, connection. Yeah. 
away we go. Mark, I want to thank you very much. It's been a wonderful conversation as always, as always. Uh, we need Plain to get together pleasure. again here. Yeah. Thank you. I look forward to it. Folks, you've been listening to Mark McNally, the chief nobody at Nobody Studios. Uh, check them out. Um, they are a fascinating play. They really are. It's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful ecosystem that they are constructing there. And they are doing some incredible, incredible work with some fascinating companies that you're going to be hearing a lot more about in the next 18 months or so. So folks, you've been listening to The Soul of Business with Blaine Bartlett. Uh, again, I am your host, Blaine Bartlett. Check out my website, uh, blainebartlett.com. There's some new stuff up there. Uh, we've got some different things that are going on. So feel free to uh, poke around and see what you can find. Okay. And we'll see you on the next episode. Thanks for listening.